Well, good morning. And, and Merry Christmas. It's so good to be together this end of the Advent season this week before Christmas. Welcome to everybody watching online as well. Thank you for engaging in worship this morning. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm the senior pastor here. It's so good to lead with you this time of Christmas. And I want to thank Katie Jackson, our youth director. Last week, she preached a beautiful sermon on Ruth, and we're grateful for her. We begin today this fourth week like we've began each week with a reading from Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron and Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab and Aminadab fathered Nashon and Nashon fathered Salmon. And Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered David the king. David fathered Solomon. By her who had been the wife of Uriah. This is the word of the Lord. My wife, Brittany, uh, works at the American Baptist Home Mission Society, the National Domestic Mission and Advocacy Partner of our denomination, and she is flourishing there. I'm so very proud of her. And recently, I was asked by one of her coworkers, Meg, to do this interview for a little ministry web series that she hosts. But she told me that while she was planning and scheduling to have me come share with her, she could not remember my name. And so she left notes for herself, but in all of the notes, she had me marked down as Mr. Brittany. <laughs> I love this. Uh, this week marks 10 years since the week that I proposed to Brittany, and becoming Mr. Brittany has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> but when we read this genealogy of Jesus, and we're noticing, like we've noticed in these last weeks, there are these names of women that emerge, incredible women that are included. Matthew takes this risk of including women in a culture that did not value women. In a culture that didn't value foreigners, these women, many are foreigners. Some readers would have seen this genealogy and thought Jesus is not that impressive to have a family tree like this. But Matthew includes all of this and includes these women to teach us something. But then we get to this fourth woman. And instead of seeing her name, we see her who had been the wife of Uriah. Mrs. Uriah. <laughs> And perhaps we read this and we think, see, Matthew still doesn't get it, doesn't get the value of these women, is just using this old husband's name. Or maybe there is another reason. So today we're going to look at this woman, the wife of Uriah, the mother of Solomon, this ancestor of Jesus. And I think we will see that, that Matthew has not just forgotten her name. Instead, Matthew wants us to see something about her story so profound about God. It feels like this story could have been written for this very moment in history. So together, we're going to look at the story of Bathsheba, wife of Uriah. We've been looking at this uh, image of these four women throughout this series. And today we get to that fourth one. Bathsheba, mother of Solomon, the wife of Uriah, and we will ask, what does her inclusion in Jesus' genealogy tell us about Jesus and his good news? So we turn in the Scriptures to the Old Testament. And we begin in 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring... At the times when kings go off to war, David 
sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites. They besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. On a cold day like today, we long for the spring. The kings did too in the ancient world because as the earth would dry, the roads became able to bear the weight of the wheels of carts and hooves of horses. You can even imagine the flowers beginning to open alongside the roads where the soldiers marched by in the spring. At a time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah, but but David remained in Jerusalem. You can see those shaking hands of some young warrior, maybe the first time leaving home, off to battle for his country, not knowing if he'll make it back. You can almost taste those fresh streams filled with spring rains and snow melt watering horses and armies as they camp around their enemy's city. There is smoke in the air in the spring. At a time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab. Out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, they destroyed the Ammonites. They besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Can you see David? in his royal bedroom, taking another nap, trimming his fingernails and tasting the latest batch of wine. Perhaps his royal robe is fitting a bit tighter than it used to. Perhaps he awoke with new pains in his knees, new gray hairs in his beard. It was the springtime. Things go off to war. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites. They besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. The writer has brought us to King David at the precise moment when everything begins to fall apart. And scholars are often surprised to find this story preserved in the account because this is King David, a beloved hero of the nation. Normally, historians would, would maybe leave out, tone down the worst bits of their beloved leaders. But here we find David, who is no longer leading his troops into battle. Not seeking after God's own heart, but at a high point of his political power. Maybe a midpoint of his age, and he stays in Jerusalem. And it is with this in mind that we then meet Bathsheba. This is verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed. He's waking up in the evening. And he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. He slept with her. And now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness, and then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Have you noticed the drama of all of these stories we have encountered in the Advent season? As Donna was preparing the children's bulletins, I I had to warn her, uh, there were not children's bulletins for all of these stories, let me tell you. (laughs) Sometimes when we've heard this story about Bathsheba before, sometimes when it's preserved or retold in movies, we get the sense that that this woman is somehow trying to tempt David. She's cast as a seductress or maybe a bad girl of the Bible. The text doesn't tell us anything like that at all. Maybe she's been characterized this way as a way for people to rationalize David's actions But it's not in the text. See, bathing on a roof was a normal practice at this day. Roofs were considered private spaces. It was a social faux pas to look at someone else's roof. In fact, it's likely only because David is in the roof of the palace that he's even able to see other people's roofs. And if Bathsheba knew she was potentially visible, it's likely that she was even clothed. But David saw her, a missionary to Morocco. 
Isla Marie Davis writes about how Rus uh, continue in some parts of the world to be a place expected to be private. She tells the story where these missionaries were living in this space, and because the, their rooms were windowless, one group of them decided to build a window, and they did it high up on this 20-foot wall. Unfortunately, that window that they built overlooked someone's roof, and so the neighbors came right over and complained. <laughs> it's boarded up to this day, she says. David's actions are quick. He sends someone, like he sent the general, to do the warring for him. He learns that she's married. He's also connected to the Hittites, so she's likely an outsider who's integrated into the people of Israel, but none of that stops David. He sends for her, sleeps with her, and sends her back. Bathsheba was in an impossible position. To commit adultery in this culture was a crime punishable by death. To refuse the king in this culture was a crime punishable by death. She had no real choice or agency in the matter. David took her, abused her, and she became pregnant. Now again, as we talk about violence and mistreatment, I'd just like to say we have resources that we are connected to as a church. If, if you or someone you know needs help, the Domestic Violence Center of Chester County is one of those excellent resources, and their website is right there on the screen. David begins to plan then the cover-up when he hears this news. So let's read uh, verse 6 of 2 Samuel 11. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. Uriah came to him. David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war is going. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace. And a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go to his house. David was then told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said to David, the Ark of the Covenant and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. So David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. David made him drunk, but in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. David has planned this perfect cover-up. We'll just get Uriah home. We'll assume the, the, the baby is his, and we'll move along with everything. But Uriah is everything David no longer is. He's loyal. He acts with righteousness and and as his fellow warriors are staying in mud and in tents and in danger, he refuses to relax at home. And so David can't create a cover story. Uriah's actions are this direct rejection of David's character. Uriah the Hittite, the foreigner, acts more befitting of the one who should rule than King David. So then David goes to his next plan. He stretches the evil that we find here beyond the original crime. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. And that's what happens. Uriah is killed. Bathsheba then becomes one of David's wives. And it seems like David has gotten away with it. I think so far in the story, one thing that we discover is that when we put our hope in earthly leaders, <laughs> we will be disappointed. We see it today, we see it all the time. When we put our hope in earthly leaders, they will let us down. How many people? Have their faith upset for those who've let them down. I want to jump down to verse 26. 
When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time was mourning was over, David had brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. This little verse is this remarkable piece of the story. David was the king. He could do whatever he wanted. He had successfully achieved this cover-up. At least he thought. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. God saw. Often when we encounter this story and we read the Psalms of repentance, we celebrate that God could forgive such a terrible evil that David did, and we should celebrate God's forgiveness. But if that's the only angle we take on this story, I think we're missing something important. Yes, David has sinned greatly. And Bathsheba has been sinned against terribly, horrendously, and God was displeased. God saw David's power, his politics, his influence, even the admiration from all his people was not enough. To hide what he did from God, for God saw. I find this story so important, so relevant to Advent, because often it feels like justice will never come. That the hurts we may have received or seen in the world, we feel like they're just getting covered up, they're moved past, they're forgotten. Why do these people seem to get away with what they've done? Why are there not more consequences? This story reminds us that God sees. So Matthew, in the genealogy of Jesus, calls Bathsheba the wife of Uriah. Not because he doesn't know her name, but because God won't let Bathsheba's story be covered up. She will not just disappear as another wife of David. She remains who she is, who she's been. Her story and David's wrongs are preserved because Matthew wants us to remember the whole thing. to be seen and heard. It's a story that could fit right into our culture, right? It was 2017 uh, when actress Alyssa Milano posted on Twitter, if all the women who've been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. And at that moment, it began a reckoning and exposure of wrongs. It led to a church to hashtag highlighting cases of abuse in religious context. The church needs to hear this story, to hear that many people, especially women and others who've been marginalized, have been sinned against and brushed to the side, and that Jesus cares. And we, we, we love the story of David. We love a comeback story. And we worship a God who can take a mess and make redemption. But there's also another part of this story here. That God comes to the aid and identifies with those who have been sinned against. She is named in the genealogy of Christ. Jesus chooses to her and we should do the same as the church. See, yes, this story tells us that God is bigger than the mess that we make. You may need to hear that today. But God is also bigger than the mess that we sometimes just find ourselves pushed into. God is bigger than the messes we are dealt. You've been dealt a hand of cards you didn't ask for. You may have had wrong done to you. You didn't ask for the family that you have, the circumstances you were born into. Those may be good or not so good. God is bigger than both. God can take a mess and bring forth a Messiah. Even in the ruins, God can and does work even when it seems like nothing good can come. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? God is already working. Even when there's that big stone of death and power and violence and it seems like it will never be moved, the stone rolls away. The tomb is empty. Jesus came to rescue and redeem those who commit sin, yes, and those who are sinned against. 
Bathsheba's life was difficult, marked by grief. And yet her story shows up. In Jesus' story, but also in other places in Scripture, and we don't, we don't read these ones as often. And so I want you to see this in 1 Kings. We learn that David's gotten very old. He's feeble. He's unable to lead. And he has not yet declared who would take over. One of his sons basically decides that, well, then I guess I'll just be king and tries to take over himself. But Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan team together to argue that Bathsheba's son Solomon should be king. And at the end of that episode, we find these verses in 1 Kings. This is 1, 28-31. King David said, call in Bathsheba. So she came into the king's presence and stood before him. And the king took an oath. And says, as surely as the Lord lives, who delivered me out of every trouble, I will surely carry out to this very day what I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Solomon, your son, shall be king after me. And he will sit on my throne in my place. So Bathsheba then bowed down with her face to the ground, prostrating herself before the king and said, May the Lord King David live forever. He didn't. (laughs) Bathsheba uses her voice, her influence, maybe even some false flattering to secure her future and the future of her son. We don't know what David and Bathsheba's lives were like between 2 Samuel 11 and 1 Kings 1. But they had several children together. An Old Testament scholar and writer, Will Gaffney, imagines this moment when Bathsheba confronted David at some point, saying something like, you're not going to shut me away as you did your first wife, Michael. You stole my life. What I had with my husband in sight of God, the man that I loved, the husband that I chose to live with, you stole our future and our children. I can't get that back. But I can have your children and the security that comes with them, and I will be mother of kings. And she was. She lived with difficulty and terrible pain in her life like many did. But as we look at the story, we're reminded that when everybody else looks past you, God looks at you. God is meeting us there. Always meeting us there. And one day, Bathsheba's line would link to a king that did live forever. In Advent, we wait. We wait for God to act, to bring light into the darkness, peace to the restless, hope to the futureless, joy to those in despair, to love to the unloved. And by the inclusion of King David into the family tree of Jesus, we are reminded that no matter how great you have sinned, God has not forgotten you. You are not too far from God. The great reformer Martin Luther said, Oh, Christ is not the kind of person who's ashamed of sinners. He even puts them in his family tree. So you've made mistakes, you've messed up, you've failed. Congratulations. You are eligible to be in the family of Christ. But by the inclusion of Bathsheba, wife of Uriah in the family tree, we are reminded that no matter how greatly you've been sinned against, God has not forgotten you either. You've been heard, or you are heard, or you are hurting. Welcome to the family of God and the loving embrace of Christ. We light the candle of love. For unto us is born a Jesus who sees and brings justice. I need to hear that story this morning. Because I've failed plenty in my life. And there are times when I think I've failed too much for God that God might forget me. And I hear this story and I remember that I'm not forgotten. And there are times in my life where the lies of shame and things that have been done to me make me feel like I'm too far from God too. There are times when I look around and I'm overwhelmed by the pain and the challenge in the world around me and I call out, how long, O Lord? God has not forgotten me. God has not forgotten you. And in Advent, we remember the lengths that God would go for you and for me. So I can think of no better way to close this morning than by giving voice to the final woman that shows up in Jesus' genealogy. A woman who herself was pressed down from the culture that she lived in, and yet by the power of the Spirit, she raised her voice, praising God because God chose to use her to bring forth Christ, Savior of the world, the one we've all been waiting for, 
the descendant of Tamar, and Rahab, and Ruth, and Bathsheba, the son of Mary, the son of God, the God who is with us and remembers, who forgives, and who is low. So as we head into this Christmas week, hear from Mary a song that she offers in the book of Luke chapter 1, a reflection on what God is doing in her very womb and the future that is breaking in at this season. This is Mary's song. This is from the Message Translation. I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing with the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me and look at what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others, His mercy flows in waves after wave on those who are in awe before Him. He bared His arm and showed His strength, scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced His chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised. Beginning with Abraham, right up till now. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to invite our choir to come forward as we sing joy to the world together. And let us pray, God of the universe. Each of us in this room have sinned and been sinned against. But you do not forget us. God, you redeem and you make a way and you sit with us no matter where we're at. So God, as you are gracious with us, may we be gracious with ourselves. May we be gracious with one another. And may we remember the hope that is found in you, God of love. A God who rescues and who is with. A God who redeems and sees. Thanks be to God. Amen.